the Word today. Yeah, let's get in the Word. I want you to get in your Bibles. Um, and Sam, I can't remember the first scripture I've got down there. Is it Ephesians? Yeah, Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Will you do me one more favor? You know what? Let's make it all easy. Just sit down. I was going to have you stand, but I looked over here at Lana with her knee, and I was like, ah, just sit for a while. I mean, it was, can we just relax today in church? Is that okay? Yeah, let's just relax today. Amen. I've taught this a lot, but I want to open up this series with this. I'm going back into our recharge series. How many needs a recharge? Yeah, it's good to get recharged. Yeah. So I'm um, talking today about positioning yourself for greatness. Come on, everybody say greatness. The Bible says that blessed be the God, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. You think I'd be used to my glasses after eight months of wearing them, and I, I read and I'm thinking, why am I feel like I'm going to puke? Because I don't have my glasses on. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, let me break this down for you, lay some groundwork before I get into this. <clears throat> I was raised in the Pentecostal church, and I thank God for the, for the foundation uh, of my faith and the way that I was raised. And how many know that, that no denomination is perfect? Um, and none of us is because humans are not perfect. But how many know we serve a God that is perfect? Yeah. I would read this when I was younger. And I, the thing with the, and I'm not throwing stones, but just in the circles that I was in. Um, one thing about Baptists is they teach really well. Um, but Pentecostals, they just want you to be filled with the Holy Spirit and learn as you go <laughs> sometimes. But um, I didn't understand much of anything. Um, in fact, when, when, yeah, let's just move on. Um, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. When I was younger and I would read the scripture, I'd be like, okay, but I'm not in heavenly places. I'm in the earth. I'm not in heavenly places, I'm here. So God's blessed me in heavenly places. So what does that mean for me in the physical? Because when I think of heaven, I think of things of the spirit. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, uh, I, you know, I think of things in the spirit. So I'm not in heaven yet, I'm not dead yet. Touch your neighbor and say, you alive? Ask them, you alive, you still good? Not dead yet, yeah? So he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. But when you study it out, here's what this means. This is what Paul is saying. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Now, just for the sake of time, I'm just going to jump into this, so follow with me. What that basically means is before you were born, okay? When you studied out before you were born. Come on, we're going to have a matrix moment here, okay? We have a matrix moment. Before you were born. God, and he's still doing it, God was talking about you, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. What that means when you study it out in the original Greek, here's what it means. It means that God is speaking well of you, and God is speaking well of me, but not just at a friendship level, but he is speaking well of me and calling me out by name and calling you out by name and telling everybody in heavenly places how wonderful you are. I don't know if I believe that. Okay, study it. It means to speak well of and call you by name. So God has spoke well of you. Listen, even with all of your hangups, even with all of your mistakes, see, do you realize how many Christian people walk around in this life, good Christian people who believe in God that still think they don't measure up to God's love, that still think that they're not good enough, that still think that God can't accept them, that still think that God's mad at them. There's a lot of people that don't come to church that believe in God, but they won't come because they, number one, they don't feel accepted, and number two, and number two, they think that they don't deserve to be here, that they're not good enough to be here. That's because they don't understand God's grace. But the Bible says that God has spoke well of me. 
And God is speaking well of you in heavenly places. Isn't that awesome? Why? Because there's greatness on the inside of you. I said there's greatness on the inside of you. I don't feel great. Well, it doesn't have nothing to do with what you feel. I don't feel great either. I feel a little chubby, a little tired. I don't feel great. It ain't about what I feel. It's about what I know. I, t I, I teach this all the time. Salvation is not what you feel. Salvation is what you know. I don't always feel saved. I don't always feel sanctified and holy. You might. I don't. I don't feel sanctified and holy, but I know that I'm saved. I know in whom I believe, and my salvation is not based on whether I feel like it or not. My salvation is based on me putting my faith in Jesus Christ and knowing what he did on the cross. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. That has nothing to do with what I feel. It has everything to know and do with what I know and, and marry what I believe. Yeah? Touch your neighbor and say, it's just getting ready to get good. Yeah. Just getting ready. Just getting ready to get good. Positioning yourself for greatness. Why, why, why did... Why, what, uh, <laughs> Sometimes my mind moves quicker than my mouth can catch up with it. When I said, you're great, I saw the looks on your faces. See, the quietness tells me that I hit the target. Bam. I see the look on your faces. And you're basing that on how you feel, and you're basing that on all your mistakes that you've made in your life and all the junk and crap that we all walk through. So when somebody tells you that you're great and you're like, huh, your mind automatically goes back to all of your mistakes and everything that people's done to you and how bad your life feels. Just being honest with you. <laughs> what makes you great is not so much you. I can split hairs with you and teach some on that, but what makes you great is Christ in you. I'm not, Kelly Floyd is not great. I'm a little cute sometimes. Did you say I'm a lot cute? Thanks, Trevor. I'll give you that dollar after service is over. <laughs> but anything in Kelly is not good enough. Kelly always screws things up. Kelly always messes things up. But it's Christ in me that makes me great. You see, so that takes the pressure off of you when you realize it's Christ in you. Come on. It's God using you. It's God using you. Lauren and Lana. It's God using Jennifer. It's God using Trevor and saying, tell Pastor he's cute. It's God. It's God's use. It's Christ in Chris. It's Christ in Sam. It's Christ in Wayne. It's Christ in Mike. Look at your neighbor say, it's Christ in you. Yeah, it's Christ in you. So it's the Christ in you that makes you great. But because of sin, listen, and because of how bad our life can be in our emotions and our soul area, it's like we have lost our position of who God made us to be. And we lost that position in the garden. When Adam and Eve fell, we lost our position. But because I was talking to my son Austin on the phone the other day, we were talking about Joshua and we were talking about Adam. And Joshua in the Old Testament, when you look at the name Jesus, I don't have time. I'm just going to do this really quick. When you look at the name Jesus, it's Yeshua. And it basically means Joshua. It's translated to Joshua. Okay, when you look at Joshua, his name in the Hebrew means a savior and a deliverer. Okay, Moses led the children of Israel out of slavery, out of Egypt. Kind of in a teaching mode, can you tell? Okay, but Moses couldn't take them into the promised land. Moses can only take them so far because he messed up. Because God told Moses to speak to the rock and let the water flow. Well, Moses got mad at the people. I get it. And the Bible says he hit the rock. And I'm like, so? You're the one that called him stiff neck. You're the one that opened up the ground and swallowed half of them. He hit a rock and you won't let him go in the promised land? Really? Sorry, that's just the way that I think. 
Okay, so you're not going to let Moses after every, what a great man Moses was. Tried to meet everybody's needs, was driving him crazy. And his father-in-law said, Look, you got to stop this. You got to get some help, boy, because they're going, these people are going to kill you. So he began to put leaders in place. That's another leadership deal. He began to put leaders in place to help him shepherd the flock. Amen. But he hit the rock. I still don't get it. My, so, I would have picked the rock up and threw it at him is what I would have done. I wouldn't have been able to. Okay, but there's a reason why God did that. Because God knew and understood that he needed Joshua. The first Adam. Come on, everybody say first Adam. First Adam, Adam, okay, in the Garden of Eden, prophetically, supposedly known as the first Adam. The first Adam failed. Adam and Eve in the garden, the sin came in. It's not so much Eve's fault. Adam was right there. He was the man. He was the covering. He should have done his job. He didn't do his job, so Eve messed up, and then he went with it, and it screwed us up for everybody, right? Screwed everything up. Thank God for Jesus. Okay, so Jesus is known as the second Adam. What the first Adam couldn't do, Jesus did on the cross. Death and resurrection, okay? Jesus, so he's the second Adam. What Moses couldn't do, Joshua did. Are you getting it? Joshua did. Joshua was a great deliverer. He was a man of war. He went in and said, surely we can go in and overtake these giants. And basically, after 40 years, because of stick enough peeps, see, I would have thrown a rock at him, um, went in and, and basically got into the promised land. So... What the first Adam couldn't do, the second Adam did. What Moses couldn't do, okay, uh, Joshua was able to do. What I can't do, listen, what I can't do, Christ in me is able to do. Are you hearing me? What Kelly can't, because Kelly's got his limitations. So what Kelly can't do because I'm limited in my weaknesses and in my sin and in my fear and in my insecurities and everything that we all deal with. What Kelly, Kelly can only go so far. And what Kelly can't do, Christ can do and take me to the next level. Jesus said in John 10, 10, that the devil has come to steal, kill, and to destroy. Then Jesus says, I love this part, but I have come, but I have come to step right in between the Satan, the Satan and them, right in between the middle of their mess and say, you know what? I have come to give them life and to, so they can have it more abundantly. Life abundantly, abundant living is greatness in Jesus Christ. And where you are limited, the Christ in you, the second Adam, will rise up because he's resurrected. He will rise up on the inside of you and take your life to a new level. Now, it doesn't happen overnight. And you may be in church for 50 years. I know people who've been in church for 50-something years. They still don't know anything. Because church ain't the deal. Church is part of the deal. But it's not the deal. There's a lot of people that have a church relationship with Jesus. And a church relationship with Jesus only works while you're here on Sunday. And if you make it on a Wednesday night for an hour. And then the rest of that relationship stops at the door. Like God clocks in and clocks out when we're here. In Jesus' name, amen. What a great service. <laughs> that stupid walk. I'll never do that again. Man, service is great. Pastor tore it up. <laughs> clocking in, clocking out. God's like, glad that service is over. They made me tired. <laughs> I mean, God don't get tired. Yeah, he don't get tired. So thank God for that. So we don't need to have a church relationship Okay, church is a tool that God uses to bring us together as a family so you can get some good stuff into you to help you begin to understand and jumpstart your faith so you can take what you've learned today and take it out there and use it on your Sunday afternoon, on your Monday and your Tuesday. Come back in, get a recharge on Wednesday so you can hit your Thursday again and your Friday and make it through your Saturday. This is a place of hope, and it's good. This is a place of faith. But let me talk to you in a mature way. Your hope and faith can't be just based on what happens here. Because what if I'm not on it? I don't want that pressure. Y'all take that off of me. Get off. I don't want that pressure. Pastor has to be on it, or I ain't going to have no hope. Well, you might as well clock out now. Because I'm not always going to be on it. I mean, I'm good, but I ain't that good. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So I'm going to talk to you in a mature manner. Church is not your only place of hope. 
Your place of hope is in Jesus Christ. Not, not the religious part of what we do. Y'all, is that making sense to you? This is good and you need to be here and you need to get good stuff plugged into you. You need to have good teaching. You need to understand some things. You need to give yourself and serve. We're going to talk about in a little in, in a moment. But that doesn't stop here. It's only part of it. Mm -hmm. Did you know that you're anointed? You're anointed. And the anointing means God's ability. Now, being raised the way I was raised, we got the anointing in God's presence mixed up. I'm just going to teach you. Don't get mad at me. Everybody smile. Uh, come on, I'm a bachelor right now. I need everybody's help. I went to Kroger's last night. Where is Birdie? Oh, Birdie. Yeah, you're going to help me. I went to Kroger's last night. I'm like, I'm going to get me some tilapia and put it on the grill. And I'm going to try to get some salad. I got French bread, pizza, chips. Put this shirt on, my mama got me. I'm like, oh my God, I shouldn't have got the chips. Anyway. <laughs> I would hear this, people in church say, ah, oh, man, he's getting anointed. Ha! Oh, I feel the presence of God. He's anointed. Okay, I understand it. The anointing of God and the presence of God go together, but they're not the same. God's presence is everywhere. Come on, say Everywhere. But his manifest presence that shows up in your life isn't everywhere. God's manifest presence is based on condition. That's why we have everything to do in this church whether the presence of God shows up or not. I said we, not Kelly, not the worship team. But we, as a company of people, have everything to do whether the presence of God shows up in a service. If your heart is not open, Holy Spirit's a perfect gentleman. He's not going to force himself on you. If your heart is not open to him, he ain't going to show up. The Bible says we enter into his gates with what? Thanksgiving. Into his courts with praise. So there's a way that we approach God. Okay, so his manifest presence is based on whether our hearts are open to him or not. Corporately. I hope I'm not confusing anybody. Okay, so he's everywhere, but when he shows up and, and does this, yeah. How many love when God shows up and just puts his arms around you? Yeah? When God does that, it's because we're open to him. If we come in church like this, see, I can do this. I'm the pastor. I have the microphone. We come in church, and, and we do this. I wonder what they're going to freaking sing today. <laughs> what kind of shirt Pastor Kelly's gone? Countdown's done. He's not even up here yet. I can't see nothing. It's so dark in here. Oh, let's stand. Oh, tired. I've been beat up all day. So loud. Why are they singing that song for? I don't like it. Why are, they, why are they doing that? Why is Dave wearing sunglasses while he's playing drums? <laughs> I don't like that song. I can't understand what they're saying. The guitar's too loud. I don't want it. They're messing up my hope. They're messing up my faith. And then we get into worship. Everybody worship. You're still stuck on the first song because the sound isn't perfect. Everybody lift their hands and just praise God. And you're like, I don't want to. <laughs> This is my hope, and they messed my hope up. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. All well, first-time visitors, I say this, will never come back, but it's okay. My family's gone, so it's Kelly Floyd in the raw today, so get ready. They'll come back. I won't have a church left. I'm like, I don't know where they went. I don't know. I think they went across the street or something. I don't know. Thanks, brother. I need it. So if we all had that attitude of what can you do for me, what is that? 
I know, see, the thing is, is we're all human. And nothing's perfect. We're trying with our sound. We're trying with stuff and everything. And if things are, what we should do is regardless of what we feel or what we hear, when we're here, we need to check our feelings at the door and come in because we're here for purpose. Well, this is going to church 101 for you. And we come in, you know what? I don't care what they sing. I'm just glad to be here. I need some help. So the only way I'm going to get help is if I open up my heart to God. It's not really based on what they do. It's based on what my heart is right now. So God, I have an attitude of gratitude to you right now. And I just honor you. No matter what's coming out of the speakers, no matter what Kelly's dressed like, or, or no matter what's going on, Tony's up there doing flips and all acting crazy on the bass guitar because that's how Tony is. Here, right? Whatever they do, I'm going to worship God because I love God and I know that he is my hope and he is my faith and he is my peace and he is my healer. When we come in with that attitude, everybody together, God will show up and, and we won't have to push on anything. Amen. Okay. So, but it's Christ in you. There's greatness in you. So we have to position ourselves perfectly. We have to position ourselves for greatness. Just because you believe in God doesn't make your world perfect. Just because you believe in God doesn't make, doesn't understand. <sighs> Slow down. Just because we believe in God, that doesn't mean we're not going to have a late payment on our electric bill. Just because we believe in God doesn't mean my mama's not going to get sick. The devil believes in God. So just because you believe doesn't mean everything's going to be all right. What you have to do is put what you believe in action. Faith without works is dead. If you're going to have some faith, then put the, put the rubber to the road. <laughs> put your faith in action and begin to work it out, okay? I need my coffee. Put your faith in action and begin to walk it out. No matter what comes your way, your faith in action, faith without works is dead. You can say, I believe all you want, but if you don't put that into action when it counts, see right here, don't count. I said right here, don't count. It's good. It gives you hope and faith. But when faith counts is when you're out there, when all hell is knocking at your door, that's when faith counts. That's when it works. And that's when you put it into action. Amen. It's good preaching. Thank you. I'm going to take up another offering for myself. Hey, let's go. So position. When I was uh, in seventh, eighth grade, uh, not too long ago. Really? I was playing for the uh, freshman football team for high school. And um, I played backyard football. And I was good at backyard football. Because backyard football, there's really no rules when you're a kid. You just, who's ever got the ball, you kill them doesn't matter. You slam their head in the ground. You, come on, y'all remember when you played back. You don't care. There's not many rules. You trip people. You punch them. You do whatever you can. Come on, guys. Some ladies. We had this. We had this. Hmm, I don't think she, she knows how to work YouTube, so I'll say this. Um, <laughs> we had this girl growing up on our street. I think she was a girl. And she, she was big. And she never wanted to be on my side playing football. And I promise, one day I was running with the football, she grabbed my shirt, Hannah, and I promise, she grabbed, picked me up, no lie, and she picked me up and she just went. <laughs> That's what it felt like. She turned me around in a circle, I was like, my God, I'm, I'm, I'm running, my God. Next thing I know, my head's on the ground. So backyard football, you don't really position yourself for anything. So when I joined the team, <laughs> when I joined the team, the high school team, I didn't know what to do. I never had pads and a helmet before and all that other stuff you wear, and it looked cool. Felt like an NFL player, and, 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 and so I was on defense, and, and the coach said, Kelly, I need you to stand here. I'm like... Oh, okay. <laughs> so I get up there, and I'm in a free safety position. I know what that means now. Okay? Free, a safety position is a defense position. You got your front line on defense. You got your guys that stand in the back like this waiting to grab the guy, to tackle the guy who's running with the ball. Okay? It's a safety position. 
there. Okay. And it's, yeah. Okay. So that's what it is. So he said, just stand there. And I'm like, okay. So I stood there. <laughs> Offensive hiked the ball, gave the running back the ball. The guy garden blocking for the running back is coming at me like a freight train. And I see him coming at me like a freight train. And I'm like, okay, well, I was told to stand here. <laughs> It wasn't pretty. So I stood there like this. This guy's coming at me full force, man. And he went, bam, like that, hit me in the chest, lifted me up, flipped me backwards, and I hit the ground, and the guy ran with the ball. And I laid there, and I, I, I never saw stars, but I saw stars that day. I was like, Mamma, is that you? And I looked up, and, and there was a friend of mine. He comes over, and he, he looks at me. He's like, Kelly, you okay? And when I could focus, because at first I saw three of them. When I could focus, I'm like, yeah, fine. <laughs> How are you? So he, he helps me up. And they're getting ready to do the next play. And the coach says, Kelly, I need you to stand there again. And I'm like, uh-uh. So this time, I positioned myself. That's what I'm getting ready for. So I stayed in there just like this. I stood there like this. Ready, Walt? Remember your glory days? Where, Marymont? Marymont, yeah. Stood there. I'm like, I'm ready now. See how I'm changed? And my stance has changed. I'm like this. And I was ready. Because that guy made me mad. Because I still know backyard football. And so I was going to put a little backyard football on his head. Okay? So he's coming at me, and he went to hit me, and I would hit him as hard as I could. Three times. Bam. Bam. And then he went to hit me, and I ducked. He fell, and I got the guy's leg and tackled him. as one of the greatest moments in my life. It was scrimmage. Nobody saw it. But I felt good. But I positioned myself. If you walk through your Christian life not being positioned, when the devil and life shows up, it's going to knock you on your tail. That's what we say in Kentucky. I never, I've been, lived in different places in our country, and nobody else in Kentucky, when they mean your rear end, they say tail. You, when I lived in Reno, see, y'all know what I'm talking about, my tail. When I lived in Reno, and I said, oh, man, I kicked my tail. And they're like, Tail? You got a tail? No, I had one. Okay, anyway. So we position ourselves. If we do not position ourselves in faith and in the word of God, when life in the enemy shows up, it will knock us out. It will distract us. It will hurt us. You know what I'm talking about? So you've got to be positioned for greatness. You can't stay at the same level you are. Why? Because God's greatness lives on the inside of you. And you have a call, you have an anointing, and you have a destiny. You have a call, you have purpose, you have anointing, and you have a destiny. You've got to stop believing what the world says and what people say about you and what you say about yourself. You've got to stop believing that, and you've got to start believing what God says about you. And the reason why you've got air in your lungs today, you've got to position yourself for greatness. So I'm going to give you some keys that's going to help position you from greatness. Can we go to that scripture in Matthew? I believe it's Matthew chapter 23. Yeah, verse 11. But he who is the greatest among you shall be your servant. I, this is not the first key, but I got to throw this out there. If you want to be great, be a servant to someone. If you want to be great, serve somebody else. Get your focus off you and your problems. I know that you're hurting. But if you can focus on some goodness and become a servant and invest your life into somebody else or something that's good, God will bless you. Because you can focus on your issues so much that that's all you see is your issues. That's all you can focus on is your issues. And whatever you focus on is the way that you're going to lean towards. So it doesn't mean that you don't have issues. And it doesn't mean that you don't work on your issues. But you've got to use a strategy. Come on, everybody say strategy. 
See, that's what God does. He said, seek my kingdom first. The kingdom of God is not heaven. The kingdom of God is the way that God does things. The kingdom of God is the way that God does things. Seek the kingdom first, and I will add everything else to your life. It is a strategy. It is a principle. It is a plan. You with me? So to be great, serve. Be an usher in the church. Be a greeter. Help with chairs. Help in children's department. Amen. Help with the food ministry. Help give clothes away. Greet people when they come in the door. Be a servant. Serve. Teach your kids how to work and volunteer. Amen. Serve. It helps you. You know, and if it's not in the church, it should be. But you don't, just don't serve in the church. You know what I love about my parents where they live right now? They got great neighbors. And the neighbors take care of my mom and papa. They really do. They care so much about them. And they serve. When we got those, those, uh, some snow, you know, I live over here and not over by them. But the neighbor lady would come out and shovel my parents' driveway for them. Serving. This whole front row one. Oh. That's how I many that's a wonderful thing. Do something for just serve people. So if you want to be great, I'm just throwing this out there. I haven't got to my text yet. We're almost done. You've got to be a servant. Be a part of something that's bigger than your world. Seek the kingdom of God first, and then God will add everything else to you. Amen? All right. You ready for the first key? Mary is. The rest of you are bored and still thinking about my getting knocked out playing football. Positioning yourself for greatness, the first key. Number one, define your identity. Define your identity. And I just feel like teaching today. I'll get loud here in a minute, probably. Define your identity. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Did I give you that scripture, Sam? Yeah? Sam, you are the queen. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. Did you all see that? Before. Before you were born, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you, set you apart. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. I ordained you a prophet. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I love when people split hairs with me about the Bible. I don't have a lot left, but they seem to try to get whatever they can. And I said this before, I had this one young guy come to me years ago, um, raised in the church and felt called to preach, which this part was funny to me, felt called to preach in ministry. And he said, <laughs> and when the spirit of silliness and awkwardness hits people, their voice changes. Sorry, that was mean. But he said, do you believe that the Bible was, was relevant for me today? No, I'm doing this for the money. Pfft, you kidding me? Pfft. Yeah. The Bible is relevant for us today. If God didn't want, if God just meant that for Jeremiah to see, then Jeremiah would be the only one that could see it. But he put it in the Bible over four or 5,000 years ago. So today, this Sunday, that somebody in this room would know that before you and I were born before we were in the womb God knew us he put that in there for you today so you would know it God put that in there before I formed you he's not talking to Jeremiah right now Jeremiah's dead <laughs> Jeremiah is in heaven okay he's talking to me and he's talking to you and he's telling you now in the year 2013 before uh, I formed you in the womb I knew you and that word new is a word of intimacy. The word intimacy, you break it down, it's into me see. And God's saying, before I formed you, I was into you. Is that awesome? Yeah. I knew you before you were born. I set you apart. That's greatness. Gotta have a matrix moment, baby. Gotta wake up. 
There's greatness in you. His name is Jesus. There's purpose for your life. So the first key to positioning, everybody say position. The first key to positioning yourself for greatness is defining your identity. Jeremiah was young. He was unexperienced, and he didn't have the word of God in him immediately in his mouth. But God, and he, but God knew, and Jeremiah began to know who called him and who he identified himself with. He said, Jeremiah, when you preach to them and give you my word, don't look at their faces because they ain't going to believe you. But Jeremiah stood up and did as a young man what he was supposed to do because his identity wasn't in people. His identity wasn't in whether people accepted him or not. His identity is the one who created him. So you've got to understand and know your identity. Let's go to Psalms quickly. Let's go to Psalms chapter 139, 16. It's okay to preach the Bible today in church. Yep. It says, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. Come on, come on, come on. This is God, okay, talking about you. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed in your book is talking about God. They were all written the days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. That's God talking about you. God saw my substance before I was formed. He knew my days before I started living out my days. Come on. Come on. If I say greatness. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about Gideon in the Bible. Gideon. The angel of the Lord. Showed up to Gideon. Gotta hurry. And he was threshing wheat in a wine press. How many know the story? He was threshing wheat in a wine press. You do not thresh wheat. I'm no farmer, but you don't thresh wheat in a wine press. You thresh it outside so when the wind comes, it blows the junk away from it. And the good stuff drops, right? It, it, it drops, okay? So he was threshing it in a wine press. Why? Because he was afraid. He was afraid that the enemy would see him, beat him up, beat his family up, and take what he was working so hard for. So he was hiding, working with his provision in a wine press. Why? Because he was afraid. So Gideon was letting his family, I'll prove it to you, was letting his family and his circumstance, hear me, define who he was. Catching it? He was letting his family and his circumstance and the enemy, okay, define who he was. So the angel of the Lord showed up, and, they said, and he said, hey, mighty man of valor. <laughs> Gideon's like, talking to me mighty man of valor he's like i ain't no mighty man of valor i'm hiding okay you get the scripture says i'm the i'm the least in my clan i'm the weakest in my house i am the weakest in my house and god shows up and calls him a mighty man of valor see gideon was letting his circumstance define who he was and he was believing what listen he was believing what his circumstance was telling him i said he was believing what his circumstance was telling him but god showed up knowing his circumstance knowing his enemy knowing how gideon felt and god has you like this i don't know why i'm doing this knowing how gideon felt but stood up and spoke past his circumstance past his fear and spoke straight to the real Gideon see that's what God does when he shows up in your life he's not so much speaking to your circumstance although he will for you he will stand up in your boat in your life and tell the wind to calm down that's what Jesus does but he will speak to the real Wayne. He will speak to the real Lisa. He will speak to the real Hannah. He will speak to the real Kayla. God knew that Kayla was going to go to the Philippines. We first said it to her. I've never been on a plane before. <laughs> so cute. No. I've never been on a... I've never been on a plane before. She said, do I sound like that? I've never been on a plane before. Okay. I've never been out of the country before. Okay. I've never seen Lion King. 
Weird, but okay. Mufasa. You'll get it later. <laughs> God shows up in Kayla's life because God knows what Kayla was created to do and who Kayla was created to be. And through circumstance and through people, through impact life, God shows up and says, part of Kayla's destiny is to get to defile Philippines. I could use Heather for the same thing. Part of their destiny is to get this season in their life is to go to the other side of the world. So God speaks to who they are, not just what's going on and not what we identify ourselves with. Gideon identified himself with weakness. Gideon identified himself with fear. Gideon identified himself with the dysfunction that was all around him. See, that's what we do. We identify ourselves with what other people have said about us. We identify ourselves with our fear. We identify ourselves with our emotions. We identify ourselves with our memory. We identify ourselves in a soul realm. But God will stand up and tell you exactly who you are. Jesus had his disciples all around him. And he said, who do men say that I am? I said I wasn't going to preach. Who do men say that I am? And all his disciples, his disciples stood around him. All that stood, stood around him and, and stood around him and they all looked at each other. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think in cartoons and that's one of my weaknesses. They all stood around him. And well, some say that you're Jeremiah. Some say... That you're Elijah. And Jesus said, I get all that. Here's what I'm really trying to talk to you, Chucky. Here's what I'm really trying to say to you. Who do you say that I am? I get what everybody else is saying about me, but who do you say that I am to you? And Simon stood up. He said, you are the son of God. You are the Christ. Y'all know that Christ is not his last name. It is his title. He said, you are the Christ. And Jesus looked to Simon and said, Simon? You are now Peter. Why is that significant? Got to hurry. It means rock. Simon was raised by his uncle. If you study it out, his father passed away when he was at a young age. And usually in the Bible times, and when you study it out, Simon was named after his father. Just like I'm named after my father. So whenever somebody said Simon... I just must assume that when they said his name, it reminded him of somebody who he once had in his life, reminded him of some hurt. Simon. And so Simon was an angry fisherman. He had a cussing problem. He was angry. Mm -hmm. So he turns to Peter and says, you are now Peter, which means rock. Simon, his motions are all over the place. Simon can't control his anger. Simon's not a really good guy. He's a dirty, sweaty old fisherman. But I'm telling you, you are now a rock. And, and, and my Father in Heaven has revealed this revelation to you of who I am. See, when you know who Jesus is to you, listen, when you know who Jesus is to you, I'm talking about revelation. I'm here. I'm talking about revelation. I'm talking about the light clicking on. I'm not talking about the church Jesus. You know what drives me nuts on Facebook is when people put up the religious pictures of Jesus and he looks like a surfer knocking on a door. Why that bugs me, but it bugs me. I hate religious pictures of Jesus. That's not what he looked like. Not that we had an artist back then, so just, you know, whatever Jesus is to you. If he's a surfer dude, then you know, hang ten with it. Um, when you know Jesus, not the religious Jesus, not the church Jesus, when you know Jesus for who he really is to you, and when that revelation comes a part of your life, Jesus will turn around and tell you who you really are. Jesus turned to Peter and said, you are now a rock. You are not all over the place. You are now a rock because you have realized who I am to you. You are now a rock. When you recognize who Jesus is, he will turn around and tell you who you really are. The angel stood before Gideon and told Gideon who he really was. You are a mighty man of valor. And Gideon said, I'm the least of my clan. And God basically told him, look, if you will go in this process with me, you will change. And Gideon began to change. And Gideon began to lead the children of Israel. And Gideon became a mighty man of valor and a mighty man of faith. He was somebody who was weak, who was afraid, and who was always in hiding. 
waiting. But God spoke to the real person. God spoke to the real person. Why? Because when God formed Gideon, before he formed Gideon in the womb, he knew who Gideon was. But life distracts you. People mess with you. And you feel like you ain't count. And you ain't, as my mama would say, I ain't got no count. That's the hills of Kentucky saying, I ain't worth anything. Mom used to talk to me. How come you act like you ain't got no raisin? <laughs> I'm like, I don't have a box of them. He was a mighty man of valor. But through the process of Jesus and through the process of time, Gideon began to be defined. So you need to let the word of God define you. You need to let God define you, not define you, not your circumstance, not what you will. Look, just because you've walked through some hell, it doesn't define who you are. If I listen to, to everybody who, who put Kelly Floyd down and tried to keep me in a box, I would not be in front of you today. But I decided to listen to God. If I still listen to the naysayers, if I still listen to the people who won't pay any attention to Kelly, I don't care, whatever. But before I used to care and it used to get me down. If I believed everything that everybody said about Kelly Floyd, I would never amount to anything. But I choose to believe what God has said about me. It's the only thing that keeps me standing when everybody else walks away. Because my identity in my family is not in you. My identity is not in my parents. My identity is not in the new movie that's coming out or not in my hobby. My identity is in the one who created me. I come from God, my father. And that's who I place my trust in. And everybody else can say what they want to. It's God who I'm paying attention to. It's all about your discovery. It's all about discovering your who and developing your you. Tweet that. <laughs> it's all about discovering your you and then developing your who. Discover yourself. I'm not prideful or cocky. That's not what I'm talking about. Be you. When I first started this church nine years ago, we're going to be nine years old the 18th of this month. Nine years old. Now, we're not going to celebrate that till the first part of June. <laughs> it's my wife's fault. She wanted to be here because she's in the Philippines. So we're going to celebrate that in June. We'll be talking about that later. Okay, but when we first started this church, I didn't know who I was as a pastor. I didn't know who I was as a preacher. And so the people that I hooked up with that mentored me, I became like them. How many were there during those days? we got a couple left. John, remember my pimp suits I used to wear? Remember those, Bev, Randy? I had some. <laughs> Ray? I had some of those. Yeah. I mean, my friend, Pastor Joshua in San Francisco, that comes once a year. He, he's going to be here in September. I'm going out there in August, hopefully for a month. No, I'm just kidding. I showed up at his church with one of those long jackets, long dress jackets. You know, and Joshua, you know, he just kind of tells you, he's like, my, my little white brother, come here. I'm like, hey, what's up? He's like, man, you know I love you. You know, when somebody first starts off with a sentence like that, you know I love you, it's something's coming. You know I love <laughs> you. Know I love you. Like, yeah, he's like, but man, those long jackets, they don't work. You're short enough. <laughs> you know? I'm like, okay. I'm not going to let you define me. So I started looking at it. Okay, yeah, he's probably right. I was wearing all these suits because the people I was hooked up with had a lot of people in their church, and, and this is how they dressed. And so I found, like, uh, even in my preaching, I was, try I was preaching, like, not on purpose, but, you know, that's who I, I just didn't, I didn't know who I was. Well, about four years ago, I came into my own because I wanted everybody to accept Kelly, the preacher, so their lives could change. But what they needed to do was accept Jesus, not Kelly. So the, one of the best things you can get free of is from people. If you don't like the way I dress, that's up to you. I don't really care. I don't always like the way that you're dressed, not that I pay attention. But that's not what it's about. I had a lady come in here to see the church one day, and we were doing things outside a couple years ago. And everybody was dressed down, and I had some, some holes in my jeans. You know, now you buy them that way. <laughs> Can't convince my mom of that. Yeah. Aaron, come on, come on the keyboard. Yeah. 
if you don't mind, please. And guys, y'all, y'all can come too, because we need to get going. She didn't come back because I had holes in my jeans on a Saturday, and the hole was right here in the knee. Okay, well, somebody like that, I probably don't want here anyway. There's tons of churches in Kentucky that you can go where they don't have holes in their jeans on a Saturday afternoon, grilling hot dogs, whatever. But I came into my own, and I'm comfortable in my own skin, finally. And because I'm comfortable in my own skin, because I'm comfortable with who Kelly is, because I realized who God has called me to be, I ain't everybody's preacher. And I don't have to be. I'm not being mean. I'm just telling you. This will help free you. Okay? I don't have to be everything for everybody because that will kill me. I just got to be who God has called Kelly to be. And the ones who God has called to be connected to me will be connected to me because God has called them. And the ones who God has not called them will not be connected to me. And I'll be honest with you. I stopped losing sleep about that about two years ago. Because I'm losing sleep over it, but they're sleeping fine. Why is it bugging me? Well, you know why? It's because I didn't know who I was. Now I know who I am in Christ, and I'm confident in who what God, I, I, I ain't perfect. I'm far from it. I got ADD all over the place. I'll confuse, I don't, I don't know. Okay, can I tell you, there ain't nobody can pastor this church like I can. Did I offend her? There ain't nobody in this church that can pastor this church like Kelly Floyd can. Nobody. Because I'm anointed for it, not because I'm always good at it. It's because I'm anointed for it. Does that make sense to you? Now, there's some guys can come in and preach and preach a great word, but preaching is not pastoring. So my point is this, because I know who God made Kelly Floyd to be, now I can be used at a greater level because I know who God has called me to be. And I ain't into pleasing anybody. I'm into make, making sure that I do what God has called me to do. If I stand in what God has called me to do, I'm blessed. I'm okay. Everything's going to work out okay. People can walk away from me, but God will never walk out on me. Because I know who I am in Jesus. I ain't perfect on it. I mess up a lot. But I know who I am. I have grace, I have mercy, and I am forgiven. You have grace, and you have mercy, and you have forgiven. You cannot let your circumstance define who you are. If you want to position yourself for greatness, you got to know who you are and know who you are in Christ. you got to know who you are. And know where your glasses are. And know who you are in Christ. I gotta hurry. Gideon went from knowing who he was to what he knew he could become. I need to get to my second point. Next week, we're gonna talk about realizing your acceptability, realizing that you're accepted. Yeah. You got to stop letting your circumstance define who you are. Okay, I'm going to say this the best way that I can. I've seen couples fight, family members fight, and I'll see one family member be all upset, losing sleep and in turmoil over it. Why the other family members smiling, laughing, and sleeping all night. Because the other person is letting the circumstance define their happiness. And I'm there myself. Okay? The other person is letting we're letting their circumstance define your happiness. Uh, can we bring that music down a little bit? It's gonna get tight. Come on, say it's tight. Come on, say it again. Say it's tight. It's going to be all right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can, and I know this is hard because we're all there. I'm there myself. So I'm not saying I do this all the time and I'm perfect at it. I'm far from it. You cannot let your circumstance define your level of happiness. You can't. You can't. Because you're, you're always going to have a circumstance. Always. 
It's like we get amazed at that. It's like it's like it's December. It's going to be Christmas? Happens every year. And it surprises us all the time. It's going to be Christmas. Yeah, it happens every year the same date. It always catches us by surprise. It's going to snow. Oh, my God. It's going to snow. It happens every year. You're always going to have a circumstance. And I say this all the time. It's not what happens to you. It's how you respond to what happens to you. And sometimes you will respond badly. That's why God gives us mercy. And that's why God gives us grace. And listen, baby, just because you responded in a poor way doesn't mean it's over. Your season of life may change. Come on. Things may have to change and you will reap what you sow. But the game ain't over. The game ain't over until God, until God says, hey, now it's over. Come on home. But the game ain't over. And as long as the game of life is being played and the grace of God is being poured out as mercy's new every morning, it ain't over and you haven't lost anything. You may have lost some battles, but the war is already won. I said you may have lost some battles, but the war ain't over. So you don't back up don't quit and you don't stop and you keep praying you invest your life and when things come your way you begin to speak the word and say the joy of the Lord is my strength it doesn't matter if you feel joy you say it why because it activates your faith it activates your faith the joy of the Lord is your strength don't stop know who you are what are you identifying with? Your hurts, your circumstance, your spouse, your trouble, your money. I get it. I get it. But our identity is found in God. And my faith is found in what the Word of God says, who I am. I may have more month than I have money. But he's still Jehovah Jireh, my provider. Mm -hmm. I got medical bills coming. I don't have health insurance. Like a lot of you guys have the same deal. I got medical bills coming. I'm like, I don't know. Hope they take payments. Welcome to Impact Life. Hope they take payments. Yeah. And whether they do or whether they don't, he's still Jehovah Jireh, my provider. That's good. And in believing that, in believing that, he becomes that to me. And so I begin to identify, not with my circumstance, but I begin to identify with who my provider really is. If they turn my electric off, he's still Jehovah Jireh, my provider, because it will get turned back on. It ain't over. There's greatness in you. You've got to position yourself for greatness. And the way that you position yourself, you got to do more than just believe. You got to act. So number one, and we'll finish it. We'll start on the next one next Sunday. Okay? You've got to know who you are. Who do you identify with? You identify with hope. You identify with faith no matter what comes your way. Your hope and your faith, your salvation is not based on what you feel. It's based on what you know. You may be walking through hell, but it ain't over. Why? Because if God is, God is for me, then who can be against me? His word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a guide unto my path. My path. I will be led forth with peace. I will be. And just because you're not or he's not or she's not being led forth with peace doesn't mean I have to not be led forth with peace. No, I will be. You do what you want. It's me and God right now because he's taking me through hell. He's taking me through high water. He's taking me through hurt. He's taking me through the fire. And you know what? When I come out of the fire, I ain't even going to smell like smoke because he's on my side. Stand up to your feet today.